amazingly, I think we are actually up and running. Um, sorry, it took so long. Um, one, to get here. Two, uh, to make this thing start. Uh, we have already lost about seven minutes. Um, many thanks again for the patience, uh, Emmy, uh, to manage all the um, online Teams uh, interactions and uh, Claudio, who at some point I think is going to show up today. So thank you. I can see that some of you decided to come. Uh, and for those of you online, we do have some people in the room uh, with great pleasure. And again, for those of you online, it is a very warm here in Bologna, uh, much warmer than uh, when I was giving these lectures uh, on Teams from Oxford. So uh, apologies, but no tie and no jacket. Uh, it has to be a white shirt. Uh, that's the only way of surviving in this room. Now, um, I know that we have left things uh, around here uh, today. And um, once again, we are recording, so uh, be careful. Um, it's not there. Uh, in case you uh, say something that you don't want to have uh, on record. As far as the people online are concerned, uh, Emmy, yeah. is <laughs> can you hear us and um, see us properly? Uh, a yes on the chat or something would be great. Seems to be okay. Okay. So, excellent. So ready to go. Uh, and um, as a reminder, we will, sorry, uh, please turn off your uh, audio and your video uh, if you're online. Um, as a reminder, we do have also a USB pen. Uh, uh, thanks to Emmy once again, because I have left it for the million time phone. I'm sure that everybody here must have like hundreds of USB pens at home. Uh, uh, we keep that buying them and we keep forgetting and uh, buying them. Uh, this should not be showing. Um, and uh, um, we will put there for the lectures on the YouTube channel at some point. I know that some people have asked, so they are getting there. Some of you who have access to the Bologna system, um, you can have uh, already a preview because uh, they are available through Teams. So all you need to do, I'm told, never try it myself. Apparently it's very simple. I believe what they say. You just have to connect uh, using your uh, Bologna credentials. Uh, Back to us. Um, there's further good news, so to speak. Uh, we have a room book on Thursday afternoon, Italian time, three o'clock p.m. to cover the time we miss or rather lost the difference is subtle um, because of uh, the death of the uh, former prime minister um, i saw that some of you someone i don't know who uh, put a little uh, link to something i wrote about that topic i just want to stress that it was a matter of respect for the institutions not for the individual for whom i have zero respect of course as anyone should i mean if you have an ethical stance in life. Uh, but the institutions, uh, I think, deserve respect. That's why we missed that lecture, and that's why the lectures, uh, by the way, all this is on record, um, the lecture uh, will be uh, regained, so to speak, on Thursday afternoon, three o'clock. We are in room three downstairs. We have the option of using this room, but apparently it's less warm over there, so they recommended to get there instead of boiling here. I might actually try to see whether we can get their room next year. Now, I think I gave you all the announcements. If I forgot something, uh, you're lucky to have Emmy in the room. Uh, <laughs> that's just that you remind me. We are recording and we can start from what AI is. I think we covered this, so it's a bit of a step back, you know, to move forward. This is the meeting, uh, I remind you, um, that launched the expression artificial intelligence. Uh, the plaque uh, there at uh, Dartmouth, uh, which I also think I mentioned uh, is a lovely place. Uh, if you have a chance to visit a um, small college uh, surrounded by forest, uh, a privilege for anyone able to study there, is one of those called uh, Ivy League places. Uh, one of those cultural things that nobody cares, but I'll not tell you anyway. Um, uh, it's called Ivy League because uh, these are the universities, I'm told, old enough to have the walls covered in ivy. Of course, if you come from Bologna, you're not impressed. But you know, if you're American and you have a few hundred years, well, that's something. Um, um, 
that was uh, Ivy League, a workshop, they need money, they launched this particular program. Uh, John McCarthy decides to call it artificial intelligence. This is from the text, 1955. I remind you that it's a counterfactual um, for the non logicians It's one of those things like, what if Napoleon had not lost at Waterloo? That's a counterfactual. Uh, or what if uh, I were a different person, etc. So what if um, is the kind of uh, reasoning here? Uh, they would be called intelligent if a human were so behaving. That's the kind of artificial intelligence we're talking about. Of these four people, uh, both McCarthy and Miski uh, remain convinced for the rest of their life that artificial intelligence would happen. Not the counterfactual, but the real one. The one that you can see in sci-fi movies. Um, John McCarthy was disappointed, as I think I mentioned, uh, when uh, discussing, if there is a review you can find online, uh, of the uh, chess game when uh, Deep Blue won uh, uh, against the world champion, saying this is a distraction, this is not AI, the real AI is not a super powerful machine with plenty of data, computational power and algorithm and heuristics which can win, there is zero intelligence forget about chess, we need to develop real AI. Discussion in Amsterdam with him, uh, over coffee, we were participating in a project. I said, John, I think that, that no, you're right on one point and wrong on another. You're right on saying that it is not intelligent. You're wrong on saying that that's not the future. That is exactly the future. The future is machines at zero intelligence able to perform the task they're supposed to perform. He was not from himself. Um, part of that, I like to interpret as an episode in the sort of cut and paste that I told you uh, by now, weeks and weeks ago. Remember uh, the idea that digital revolution is uh, separating, is decoupling things that we have inherited from modernity as a single block. I made a few examples. Uh, I think one of them, um, there are many, and you can play with the idea in many ways. But one of them, classic, is the decoupling of law and its territoriality. Modernity, they are a single block. Post-modernity or our age, they are detached. Other times, the same sort of digital power glues together things that we thought were completely independent. One of the things, since we are in sort of in a more sort of legal context, is our identity, who we are, and our data. Not something that you would take for granted uh, some uh, years ago, but today for us, personal identity, personal data, my information, who I am, are a single block, thanks to the digital uh, revolution. So in this cut and paste, artificial intelligence can be understood either as a cut or as a paste. Most people, I would say the majority, the orthodox uh, view is paste a pace between engineering and some kind of biological intelligence. At some point, these two things will glue together and you will gain something that is artificial engineering intelligent. Now, uh, the view that I've presented in these lectures is the opposite, that this is a cut, is a separation between the ability to uh, act, solve a problem, take a little task, with success in view of a goal and any need to be intelligent in doing so. We will come back to this point, but essentially that generates one problem next, which is normally when you separate agency and intelligence, what you get is stupidity. You get a lot of problems. You don't get solutions. You drive at zero intelligence, there's a disaster, etc. So how come that, if you are right, this divorce now is successful? Part of the reasoning is that you embed that divorce within an environment that makes it successful. In other words, you shape the environment so that that divorce between agency and intelligence works. More on this as we move forward, and I will show you also some uh, specific examples. But this was the point. AI as a divorce between agency and intelligence. 
I also told you that, of course, the sky is the limit. Um, this is when, uh, in 2017, we passed the threshold of having machines that do speech recognition better than humans. We used to share, therefore, the past with other biological forms of agency, horses normally, and if you listen to uh, normally uh, uh, during a course in philosophy, sooner or later, a philosopher will mention horses because we are stuck with that. Of course, we move to a, a past where we have uh, artificial environments. Uh, agency becomes a mixed business of humans with technology. And this is the kind of future that we are already witnessing now. And it will just grow. It will keep growing. We in, are embedded in an environment where other forms of agency are entirely artificial. It doesn't mean they are intelligent, but they are not natural like a river or an earthquake. And they're not biological, like a dog or another human being. They are somehow in the middle. I think I mentioned, uh, again, this is a whole big summary from uh, last week, that we don't really have a theory of artificial agency as such. We have bits of it. If you look at the philosophy of action, you have a theory of mindful, teleological agency, the human kind, the, the kind that says, I am responsible because I want you to do this. I have a plan to do this. This is how I'm going to do it, etc. Et so it's rational. It's not only sort of successful, but it's also intelligent, full of mental states, purpose, intentions, etc. Well, that we have plenty of philosophy. Then we have a little bit of uh, causal interactions. Imagine uh, narrow networks, uh, multi-agent systems. I mean, it's not really a theory of action uh, or agency but it gives you a sprinkle of ideas over there. We also have in ethics a corner which is interest in action when action is taken by natural events that cause evil. The whole debate about the Theodician problem, how come that God is one, omnipotent, two, omniscient, and yet things are so shitty in this world? Something has to give. Normally what gives is Natural disasters are only apparent disasters, uh, and uh, human disasters are due to our own freedom. But the theory and problem hints at a theory of agency that needs to take into account the river, the earthquake, etc. But as you can tell, we're just moving around the central topic. And a theory of artificial agency as such, well, welcome to uh, the sort of boundaries of our knowledge. I hope someone here in this room or online will decide to develop it. I gave you a bit of this uh, sort of uh, understanding of what makes the divorce work. I told you there are at least these five elements. Uh, I presented a map of the variety of kinds of uh, artificial intelligence that we have. As a reminder, uh, this is an archipelago. People even disagree on this map. So not only, no, it's not the map. But, uh, and, and it's not a matter of level of abstraction. It, at the same level of abstraction, two data scientists or AI people would not put things in the same way. The point is not to adopt this map, but it's to show you, look, there's plenty of things going on. AI is not a scientific term. Scientific terms work in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. If you remember, water, H2O, for example, uh, triangle, uh, three sides, three angles, figure of the plane, etc. AI doesn't have that. Um, it's more uh, finger pointing towards um, a whole area, an umbrella concept. However, that is not a problem in itself because for a lot of things important in life, we don't have a definition. We don't have technical or scientific terms as water H2O. Democracy, friendship, uh, pornography, as I remind, remind you, the user joke, I recognize it when I say it, the judge, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So AI is a little bit like that. Uh, is I recognize it when I see it. I have criteria according to which I can identify something as AI or not. So what's the difference between say I um, Excel um, spreadsheet and something that is more AI? An Excel spreadsheet, for example, doesn't learn. The moment my Excel spreadsheet starts being seriously not uh, upgraded by Microsoft with something that remem remembers and learns, 
Well, you start really having doubts whether that is or isn't a piece of AI. That was the first step that we took. And uh, now I'm not quite sure we covered this. So some help from the room mm -hmm. would help. Did we see this or not last week? Because I think we got here. Not yet. Someone said, I haven't seen it before. No idea. Excellent. OK, so this is uh, the first point. Um, how did we got to where we are today? Why AI is so successful today as opposed to not so much in the past? So as you know, AI, if you look at uh, winters of AI on Wikipedia, it goes through uh, phases or stages. Um, a summer of AI is when there's a lot of money, a lot of hype and some success. So everybody thinks, OK, this is it. Now, a breakthrough uh, is going to change the world, uh, revolutionize uh, everything, this and that. Um, the winter is when money dries up, success, not so much. Uh, the hype disappears. Journalists finally get uh, excited about something else. Thank you, journalists, for making a mess of our lives. Um, mass media being part of the problem these days, not part of the solution most of the times. How come that we are now on a new, quote unquote, summer of AI? Well, because we move, um, and there was a, it, it's probably the most significant move in the history of AI. We move from AI being a branch of mathematical logic to AI being a branch of statistics. The difference is fundamental. And I'm super simplifying. Uh, so even someone who's going to listen to this you know, in 100 years, because they lost uh, themselves on YouTube and they click on this erroneously, um, I know it's a caricature. Uh, however, there's a, a, an essential point here, a can, which is when John McCarthy uh, and people like me uh, used to teach a little bit of uh, 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 lisps or prologue or that kind of uh, uh, mathematical logic based AI, it wasn't really much uh, of a difference between what they were doing in AI and what we were doing in mathematical logic. Essentially, the whole thing depended upon one fundamental essential step, which was if then. It was a deduction. Um, I think we covered this a little bit uh, during the Q&A that someone asked, and I remember last week, about abduction and induction. I hope you remember that kind of questions. If you don't, you were not listening. Um, so that move from uh, uh, a mathematical logic which deduces from if A, then B, to a statistical approach that looks at probabilities, more on this precisely in a few slides, and associates or correlates a certain amount of data and patterns to some kind of information. That shift, that is what we call uh, deep learning, machine learning, neural networks, etc. Now, the interesting thing is that the people, remember Minsky? Uh, Minsky was a big professor at MIT. He wrote a very influential book on the perceptron. The perceptron was one of the first models of neural networks. You don't have to know anything about it, but in case the entry in Wikipedia I checked is very well done. The perceptron had, I think, only one layer, and you could prove that some things that you could do in mathematical logic, you could not do them with that neural network. I think we are in the 60s, don't quote me on this, double check. But from that moment onwards, there was the, the death of any research on our networks. So in other words, the logic so, uh, group won the game, unfortunately, if you like. And by proving that one specific kind of neural network could not deliver what mathematical logic could at the time, they just declared that that was not the future of AI. Fast forward at least a decade and more computational power, better ways of designing those uh, neural networks with many, many more layers, better algorithms or ways of connecting threshold and so on, those um, uh, neural networks, lots and lots and lots of data. And all of a sudden, Minsky was wrong, neural networks were right, and the infight within AI between the logic group, if you like, the logic party and the statistical party. Well, after a 
initial victory by the Logic Party, the Logic Party was defeated, and today we have what we have. Chat GPT would have been impossible with the Minsky approach, mathematical logic, if then. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, we had a few sort of um, expert systems, stuff like that, but it wasn't the astonishing success that we have today. Now, the astonishing success, therefore, is also due to the winning internally within that philosophical debate of the party that supported uh, the, uh, uh, the statistical approach. We reach ChatGPT. Now, that is the standard definition of ChatGPT. Um, uh, some people, uh, I know you get interviewed by a journalist, says, oh, you must be astonished by ChatGPT. Now, today, the things that it does, so, so, yes, you can be astonished, but you need to remember that ChatGPT that we have today is Ford. Now, anyone who has watched any Netflix series shows that if you join number four, you might be astonished by number four, but someone has been watching it from number one, two, and three. It has been around for a little while, not only ChatGPT, but it's, no, the deep learning has been around for much longer. And I told you, the perceptron, we're going back to the 60s. So it's half a century, not yesterday that this stuff is around. So, dear journalists, yes, you might be astonished, but anyone who has been working on this stuff for a while, I mean, I wasn't even born when they were already discussing this, and I'm 58, okay? So, no, I'm not. Um, what is astonishing, though, and the journalist in this case has some uh, sort of, uh, good reasons to, to be, is the success. Because when uh, ChatGPT was uh, working at the, um, as number three, not even 3.5, um, the mistakes, the logical limits were almost laughable. I mean, it was a toy. But the immense amount of training, data, and computational power, and therefore the millions of dollars put into developing 3.5 and 4 now, they show it really does an amazing job. So if you try to trick, that's something else for, again, on record. If you try to trick chat GPT um, or GPT-4, um, the one that you pay for, and I don't recommend anyone to pay for, I've done that no, a few months, it works pretty much. No, for what you need to do, 3.5 is free, is as good as any other. But if you want to trick uh, GPT-4, uh, you can trick it, of course, only once or, or twice. Uh, the number of times uh, I've been told, oh, Professor, like, this doesn't work. When I try, it does get the answer. I said, I know, it's a one-off because it learns. So if no, a thousand people, for example, try the following trick, which initially GPT or GPT-4 couldn't so, uh, solve, you do that too many times, and of course, no, it has moved on. The following trick uh, would be something like, um, uh, Mary's uh, mother has a daughter, what's the name of the daughter? So, well, Mary's mother, Mary, the mom of Mary has a daughter, what's the name? And it says, sorry, I don't know, I, I have no idea about individuals. Well, it's, it's Mary's mother, so clearly Mary. But of course, if you try that now, it doesn't work because, of course, you try that too many times and even you now that sort of little trick gets learned. And as we move on, more tricks and better solutions will arrive. Some of the things that remain um, unsolved and probably unsolvable at this stage is not this logic, not little uh, sort of, uh, funny uh, games, but a kind of training that someone somewhere uh, has been uh, uh, able to give to this sort of, of uh, systems. I'll show you more in a moment, uh, and uh, there will be one or two slides. Even, I mean, to, to call them technical is, is a joke, um, but no, showing a little bit under the hood what's going on. But one thing that you should try is, for example, recipes. If you try a recipe, uh, no, which I did uh, for this class, and you ask uh, GPT to give you a recipe for horse meat, it will give you a whole lecture on how you should not even think about eating a horse. It's no, protected by religious 
cultural, ethnographic, etc. Now, I spent four years in Puglia, in Bari, uh, for my sins, uh, and horse meat is totally ordinary. You go to a restaurant and there's the horse steaks. Same uh, system, you ask, give me a recipe for hamburger or any sort of cow or not, uh, so perfectly fine. So here's the joke. I will be surprised to some extent if it were a Texan that has been trained, no, GPT. Eat cows, that's perfectly fine. Horses, you don't even there. Now, if you insist they give you, it does give you a, a recipe for the horse meat. But you know, this is just a recipe. And of course, imagine doing that not in the UK, not in Italy, not in the United States, but in India, where you know, animals have a different kind of, uh, sort of uh, 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 status. And or in any other country where you know, their animal is in one category and the other is in another. You might ask, I don't know, a recipe for scorpions um, and, and so on, or a recipe for dogs. This is a light way of presenting a real problem, which is, who has decided what kind of ultimate training these systems get? And I mean, they are trained. Uh, here are the two sort of uh, red uh, words, keywords uh, here. Fine tuned using both supervised by humans and reinforcement learning techniques. The reinforcement is a little bit like a game. If you win, you get points. If you lose, you lose points. So by playing a lot, you get. Doo -doo 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 and you get better, better, better at winning the game. But the supervise is done by humans. Normally some underpaid people somewhere in one country in Africa, it could be, uh, I think Kenya, um, checking with Emmy, with the Kenyan, yeah. And it could be a dollar, two dollars an hour. And of course that, that supervision is not just about which kind of meat you should or should not eat. It's also about all the possible horrible things that people would like to ask and GPT should not provide an answer for bombs, pornography, um, violence, um, abuse, terrorism. So welcome to a world in which the humans have to train the system to behave properly. The values that are behind the training by humans of the systems, that is where the problem is. So it's no longer about Mary's mother and the system not knowing that Mary's mother has a daughter whose name is Mary because it's just a box of no, digits. It's mostly about the humans behind deciding some things are okay, some things are not. And if one feels relaxed about this, well, one shouldn't. Because now this company, uh, which started as OpenAI, not for profit, etc., now is totally changed direction, now is for profit. One day, what if that 51% is bought by a country that has values that we don't quite agree with. Maybe it has values that uh, sees human beings as boxing different categories. Normally, no, men, white, citizen, and then the rest of the world. Not a man, no white, no nothing. And it could be a woman, it could be anyone belonging to any other category. It could be people with different skins, ethnography, religion. What, what if the kind of system they're using has been trained by that country? And this is not science fiction. I mean, I hate to push the usual agenda of human rights, but honestly, zero transparency, not knowing how things are done and not knowing to what sort of ethical code these companies abide, it doesn't make me feel comfortable. As for many other problems in other contexts, social media, big data, um, uh, the whole world of Bitcoin and, and currencies and so on, the strategy at the moment is fingers crossed. We hope everything is going okay, but there isn't much. Uh, uh, there isn't much uh, in terms of our uh, uh, framework to protect us. So back to us. It's built on on top of that language models, etc. Uh, I don't understand why this thing keeps popping up, but um, this is uh, something that um, Emmy should not see because she knows, uh, but anyone who doesn't know anything about data science, anything about computing, anything about uh, AI, well, this is for you. So this is traditional cooking. This is how we used to uh, do uh, AI, or in fact, problem solving in the logic way. Uh, this is a carbonara, by the way, for anyone online who doesn't recognize it. 
and there are places where you don't recognize it. I mean, trust me, I, I've been there. Uh, in one day, um, uh, I was at Wilson College. Uh, where I was desperate. Uh, there was no food. I went to a restaurant nearby. It was Oxford, and I got a carbonara that was in some kind of soup. Literally, there was water in it. So back to us. This is the real carbonara. You never know what you learn in a, in a course uh, for a PhD. Um, to get there, the traditional cooking is ingredients plus recipe. Of course, the ingredients are the data, the recipe is the algorithm, you get the outcome. The machine learning, either supervised or unsupervised, uh, is another kind of cooking. You show the data, you show where you want the data to go, and the machine learns the recipe. It learns to cook as well the uh, particular recipe, which could be called lots and lots of pictures of that, uh, cats. Uh, there is a cat in the end learns to recognize a cat. You can do even reinforced cooking full stop. I mean, full stop reinforced uh, cooking um, or learning um, goes only so far. But in theory, you just show them pictures. And at some point, you don't even tell the machine that there is a cat. And by showing lots and lots and lots and lots of patterns, the machine is able to extract some kind of learning that is embedded in the uh, data. We've been here before. A long, long time ago, that's for the philosophers. There's a debate between uh, different empiricists, um, oversimplifying Berkeley, Locke, that world, and the empiricists are debating about universals. Now, remember, the universals, like horse, they're actually talking about horse. They have uh, the horse there, um, and they try to decide how do you get to the idea of a horse? How do you learn the concept of horse? And in uh, uh, Locke, John Locke tells you, well, by looking at a lot of horses. You look at you know, zillions of horses, and at some point, almost like a machine, bingo, you get the idea of horse, and from there on onwards, you learn that that is a horse. Berkeley instead says, no, 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 that's not the way. You choose the horse, the best horse you've ever seen, and you have, as it were, a specimen, a sample, and everything else will be compared to the best horse you have ever seen. The problem behind the two approaches is that they presuppose the answer that they're trying to find. The locking approach. Remember, set of horses, you look at a lot of horses and you extract the idea of horses. Who put together the set of horses in the first place? Don't tell me someone with the idea of a horse, because then we are back in a cycle, which is exactly what happens in John Locke. Just someone somewhere decided that you show a thousand pictures of a cat. And then you train the system on learning that it's a cat. Uh, there are some funny uh, sort of examples, counter examples, one of which uh, was shown to be well, one of our students, uh, David, uh, for Emmy. Um, David, uh, uh, show me that uh, uh, this beautiful article where people showed uh, gazillions of horses, in this case, really, uh, to uh, uh, no, what? deep learning, deep learning system, learn to recognize horses. But then it's, it's not working. And it wasn't quite clear what, what was wrong. Well, the problem is that all the pictures that have been shown of horses to the machine had a little stamp on the corner top right. And that's what the system learned. Learned that whatever that was with that stamp was a horse. You showed the picture with that without the stamp and bingo didn't quite work. There was something similar about wolves, for example. The machine learned white snow. It hadn't learned wolf. So when a wolf was shown in the summer, couldn't recognize it because there was no snow. You start thinking that anyone, <laughs> even remotely claiming that there's some intelligence in all this, hasn't quite you know, either grasped what's going on or is deluded about what could happen in the future. So people who know the grandfather or the fathers of AI, they're always fathers, by the way, of course, for them, the little child, it's beautiful. This for the non-English speaker will not work, but I have to share this uh, any time. Ogni scarafone è bella mamma sua. Obviously, like every monster is beautiful to his mother. That's the Italian translation. 
every piece of junk of AI is amazing as the ultimate solution to the father of AI. They're called father of AI for a reason. So obviously they're true believers. They're there. They spend their entire life. They're two in price uh, guys. In inevitably, they think there is something in it. Whom would you ask about the beauty of the monster? The mum, the Italian mum, or someone else? Who would you ask about the success of AI? The father of AI or someone else? So back to us, not being able to recognize the wolf because the snow is not there, not being able to recognize the, the, uh, the horse because the stamp is not there. Reinforced learning uh, uh, or cooking uh, gets a long way. So this is a bit of a, uh, a sort of summary. Ingredients, recipes, traditional cooking, traditional programming, you get the dishes, you get the, the problem that does what it's supposed to do. For example, here, you could have a chess program. Ingredients, dishes, machine learning, coding, cooking, so to speak, uh, and you get the recipes. It learns how to do it. If you are even further ahead, the reinforced cooking, you show them just the recipes. Uh, they might get the dishes and ingredients. So you can play with this. Uh, we will move on because uh, it's not terribly interesting at this stage. It will be in uh, uh, the um, uh, recording. That's the first analogy with cooking. Second analogy before showing something technical, a calculator. ChatGPT is related to language as a calculator, the pocket one is related to maths. With some important analogies and one fundamental difference. Before this, a social comment. In the 70s, when those things came out, and uh, you know, we kids were going to school. Some of the greatest mathematicians at the time, including Erdogan, uh, uh, said that was at the end of mathematics. Introducing even pocket calculators at school would mean that people would no longer be able to learn, exercise their minds, et cetera, et cetera. This reminds us of Plato with the invention of writing. That was the end of everything and anything. It was worse than, no, destroying civilization. Every time it seems you, know, you have a new technology to record, to disseminate or process, record, disseminate, process information, someone somewhere will tell you that's the end of civilization as we know it. In a way, yes, because their civilization is archived and another one is coming. But surely maths has survived pretty well uh, despite the arrival of pocket calculators, and so will be essay writing. Of course, no one will claim today that is a mathematician just because you know how to press you know, the buttons or whatever calculus operation you have to do there, and no one should claim to be Hemingway just because you know how to press essay like Hemingway on chat GPT. Despite this, of course, this is the debate at the moment. How do we ever train again students at university to write an essay now that they can use? Well, some of them will and some of them will not. Some of them will be able to use them to learn better and some will think that no, it's enough to press sort of 3,000 words essay uh, Hemingway style on ChatGPT and they think they are smart. As often in this case, um, it will further sort of discriminate between people who know how to use it and they have it access to the technology, they're lucky enough, etc., and those who either don't have access or they think they can misuse it and, and so on. But back to us, uh, there are some similarities between ChatGPT and a calculator, pocket calculator. First, it's not a database. I hope it's obvious, and I hope you know how a lot of people actually discuss about ChatGPT as if you were a database. Because this is on record, I will be careful, but there's been a recent debate in Italy on a recent sort of um, decision, legally speaking, which gave me the impression, a robust impression, that the people on the legal side were discussing about chat GPT, privacy, the use of data, as if it were a database. They never used the word. So it will be unfair to accuse those people of deep incompetence. But the impression was there, as in chat GPT, has my data. No, it does not. In the same way as a pocket calculator does not have numbers in it. So 
if you want, and uh, it will come at the end of this lecture, if you want to undo what ChatGPT has learned, you had to undo the learning. You can't remove Italian data from ChatGPT, as I heard people saying, if you remember recently. Now, that's why OpenAI had to block ChatGPT in Italy for a, a little while. Uh, and if you didn't have a VPN or you didn't use one of those uh, uh, Opera and something, uh, you will be stuck with that sort of uh, block. Of course, there is nothing intelligent in the most advanced, amazing pocket calculator that does more maths than anyone can possibly imagine. You take Mathematica, which is a the program to do any maths that you will ever need in any science, science whatsoever, and you basically have to be an engineer to really know how to use it properly. Any science that we do on, on this planet these days is done at some point, if it's done very seriously, using Mathematica, Wolfram, etc. Um, no one in his right mind would think that Mathematica, that, that, that software, is either intelligent or a great mathematician. It makes no sense. Of course, there's no understanding. But it's not a stochastic parrot either. This stochastic parrot has become uh, uh, popular in the literature on uh, uh, ChatGPT and the so, uh, large language models. Some of them, you know, the terminology varies, but also foundation uh, models and so on. Uh, because of an article written some time ago, uh, criticizing uh, Google for the way it was uh, unethically developing in uh, some of its tools, but also treating some people, etc. Uh, the article is available online um, and it has in uh, part of the title is uh, Stochastic Parrot. Now, it's, it's a nice image uh, and it gives you a little bit the sense of stupidity. Um, but actually, if you think about it, a parrot is way more intelligent than any sort of engineered uh, artifact we have. And ChatGPT does not repeat like a parrot anything. It's not like putting out there things that has been memorized. It really builds new sentences, new sort of uh, phrases, new paragraphs, new text. It does that by having learned how those bits go together in a particular way. Very, very remarkably so. But there is nothing no, like a parrot copying. Uh, so that again is a, a red herring, you would say in English, like a distraction. However, uh, when I put this on uh, uh, LinkedIn, uh, someone actually had the uh, male attitude uh, to explain to me that it was not algorithmic deterministic. Uh, again, for those of you who are not uh, exposed to that kind of uh, culture, that's a man's plank. Uh, and it happens to everybody, men included. Uh, it's gender neutral. Uh, it's normally when people tell you, no, look, your name is not spelled like that. It's spelled differently. It's my name. Do you think I don't know? Like, and so someone was telling me, no, oh, Professor, you're a bit confused if you compare this to a calculator. It's not algorithmic deterministic. Really amazing. Thank you. So I had to put a note saying, I know. Of course it isn't. So the difference with, between ChatGPT and a pocket calculator is that whenever you enter that formula in the pocket calculator, if it works, it will give you always the same result. It may not work, it might be broken, the battery might be off, whatever it is, then it doesn't give you the answer. But if it gives you an answer, it's always the same. Oversimplify. Two plus two, it will always be four. It will never be 3.5, 3.9, well, let me see. ChatGPT, even at a distance of, um, say, one, two, three, 3.5, four, et cetera, it will give you a different answer even to the same prompt, which is the little thing that you put at the beginning, because it has been trained. And if that prompt is even just a little bit different, it will give you a different answer. If you do that prompt in a different language, it will give you a different answer, because we can see it's all probabilistic. So the chances are that it will rearrange those strings of Letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, sections, text differently. So if you ask something even long, recently um, uh, I was curious about uh, uh, an American um, famous um, uh, writer who died recently. Uh, I think it's called McCarthy. Yep. Uh, anyone here? Um, 
some help. Um, and um, uh, I'll go by memory, I'm, I might be misspelling his name. Um, apparently very famous in Italy, decently famous around the world. But one of the famous journalists in Italy uh, wrote that this was the greatest writer of American literature, full stop. Now, I'm not an expert on American literature in any possible sense and meaning, but you start remembering something like Mark Twain, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Edgar Allan Poe, in the end, ah, I'm not so sure. So I asked ChatGPT, who are the top, no, 10, wasn't there. Okay, 10 more, he wasn't there. 10 more, finally, number 29, we go, it's Jeff. I asked, who are the top 100? And the list was different. So if you ask ChatGPT to give you the top 10 American authors, he gives you those 10 names. You ask 10 more and 10 more, and you get 30, one to 30. But their list from one to 30 is different from if you ask who are the top 100 American writers from one to 100. The top 30 are different, different order, slightly differences, but they're not the same. Now, in theory, if this were in any way algorithmically deterministic, it should give you the top 30 always the same. It doesn't because it's probabilistic, because it puts together language in a way that makes more sense if you ask for 100 rather than. So this is what happens, and this is where uh, I'm proud well, that Amy is here because you can see that I also do see stuff. Um, I recommend this uh, little uh, YouTube, uh, very short YouTube um, introduction to how ChatGPT is trained. Beautiful, simple, elegant. I think anyone with very little uh, training and pre-knowledge would be able to understand it. So we'll spend uh, five minutes on this in the next slide. So this is uh, your prompt, your ask. Alice painted her house and you want ChatGPT to complete that. This is the history. And this is the probability that the green answer, or which in this case would be brown, would be in the right place. So what is the next element, the green bit? Well, the probability that the next element, this question mark, the probability for the next element is brown, given the history, you know, the data that ChatGPT has seen is 0.2. I'm making up, okay? We don't know. Zero. Uh, it, don't worry about the numbers. I mean, just, or probabilities always go from 0 to 1. You know that. Not, nobody's ever confused about that. Uh, zero means there is no chance. There's bachelors happily married, zero. And bachelors unmarried, one. Normally, life is anything that happens between zero and one. Hmm. Okay, back to us. What is the probability that the uh, variable, the green, is probability that the green is beige, given the history, 0 0.1. That that is actually red, 0, 0, 005, because it's 0, 0, 009 with 0, 0, 008. Now, replace these things here, and it will work. Alice painted a house brown, Alice painted a house beige, red, because, and you would expect something next, she painted a house with, no, a big brush. I don't know. Uh, um, so the way that is truly amazing is that this green bit here gets replaced with something that makes a lot of sense. So if here was, instead of Alice painted a house, which I know it's just a cut and paste from the uh, YouTube video, where who are the top 10 uh, writers in American literature ever, you would have here the probabilities of Hemingway, Edgar Allan Poe, Mark Twain, doo -doo -doo. and the answer here will be put according to the probability. Where do the probability come from? History. What's the history? All the data to which ChatGPT has been exposed, trained on. That's what it looks like, therefore. You've got a probability that will be giving you a parameter of the fact that the next element, capital X, is actually the right element 
given the history x1 to xt. This little thing is a language model and is a special case of autoregressive sequence model. In other words, you know, given a certain past, this is what the future looks like. Now, I just uh, recently spoke to a, a, post, no, a potentially postdoctoral person uh, uh, and um, we're discussing about ChatGPT and you want to test. Now, this person doesn't does really know conceptually. They don't have to know the technical. It's like, oh, yeah, no, ChatGPT can, can predict the future. Really? Do you have any idea how ChatGPT has been trained? It's always a, a real mirror. It's trained on history to fill the gap of that little knot or whatever you put there. So you have a hole here which get filled by history. History is what the data have been provided. So predicting the future, I started digging. It less sounded like this person has no idea. And in fact, he had no idea. It was just not inventing on the spot. And normally happens with very bright people, um, now especially the people who come from either Oxford, Cambridge, or Harvard and Yale. Those are the two couples I'm learning, one side or the other side. They think they are smart enough to get out of any hole, including this one, by just digging and chatting. You dig and dig, and at some point you understand they actually don't know what they're talking about. So I'm not an expert, but I was not. I'm knowledgeable enough to understand when someone doesn't know um, or knows less than I do. So in this case, um, you got this theta, uh, the Greek letter, is not a zero, uh, as a parameter. How many parameters do I need here to make ChatGPT work? Millions. In fact, ChatGPT, we know that uh, because that was open at the time, AI, told us that it was 175 billion parameters. That's a lot of a lot of lines like that. And train and train and train. So at the end of the day, it will give you in the right list. I go by memory, Mark Twain, Hemingway, Edgar Allan Poe, Scott Fitzgerald, and the rest. Just in case one thinks that philosophy lectures are not useful. No, 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 you know about Carbonara, you know about American literature. <laughs> Back to us. Um, Open AI is no longer open, it's opaque, so we don't know how many um, parameters support ChatGPT4. But these parameters, which you can imagine as tiny little structures, which tell you all the links in that sentence, and what's the probability that uh, one would say, oh my goodness, today the weather was very hot, is the right answer, linking all, all those little links, this structure internal, essentially, the fabric of the language to which ChatGPT has been exposed. Well, we assume from ex external data that has one trillion of these structures, of these parameters. That's why once you move to imagine for a moment science fiction, but not the science fiction is not going to happen. So that a future, so. Uh, chat gpt5 imagine you move from one trillion which by now it's indistinguishable from a human text to 10 trillion the game is over i mean you have no way to be able to say whether any any interaction with that piece of software is an interaction with a human being or with a system that was point number one we keep going uh because remember, in that little uh, round things, I said, look, uh, first we move from mathematical logic to statistics. That's how it works, conceptually speaking. Two, we've been enveloping the world around these abilities. That's very intuitive in terms of robotics, but it's true for all the kind of work that we do with AI at large. If, for example, my, um, and I'll show you a couple of examples uh, more concrete, but if um, I have two um, nests at home, these are uh, thermostats. Uh, they used to be an independent company, and now it's owned by Google. Um, and uh, they keep praying in terms of when you are home and how much you like the house, warm or cold, constant, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year. And 
one of the factors that is crucial is to link them to your mobile phone. Because of course, that's the only way they know whether you're home or not. Now, once the, the nest is linked to your mobile phone, then it also knows that you are approaching the house. And so it can turn on the central heating. It knows that you're leaving, so it can turn it off. On and off. So all that training happens because of that link. If you went for an environment that can put together your mobile phone, the, uh, the nest, the little uh, thermostat, and actual the actual physical central eating in an environment that is friendly towards those interactions, you wouldn't have any quote unquote apparently if you were by a human being, if there were a butler there to turn on and off for you, Mr. Floridi, uh, that kind of intelligent behavior. So enveloping is um, an envelope. I think we covered this a little bit last year, if I remember correctly, a couple of people here. Uh, um, an envelope is a, a technical term that comes from um, uh, mechanical engineering. For a mechanical engineer, an envelope, uh, which is uh, the word that, that you would use to send a little uh, mail with a stamp from the past, uh, is a space, the three-dimensional space that you see in the background here, where a robot can operate successfully and safely. So in this particular picture here, these are real robots uh, in a, a car factory. You can see the human here, and this space clearly is not for the human. It's a 3D space built for the robots. So I'm borrowing that term to explain the enveloping of the world around the abilities of AI. You envelope the, the, the world, at least these are some of the factors, lower cost. It has to be very cheap. If it's expensive, you're not going to do it. It becomes impossible. Infinitely more computation that we have ever seen. When uh, it was 50 years uh, from, I think it was 50 years. Anyway, it was anniversary, sorry, um, of the, uh, what was the anniversary of the uh, moon landing? Um, it was a few years ago. People decided 50 is too much, um, I guess. Hmm? Um, I mean, I was a, a child, really, really little child when I saw it. So it might be actually uh, 50 years. Um, people had some fun in comparing how much computational power had NASA, who I was in charge of that, to put a man on the moon and how much computation you have today in well, literally this, this thing. is unbelievable. I mean, there was, they had the, the whole Apollo that station had, just in terms of memory, not enough to put a newspaper in digital version on the memory of that sort of, uh, capsule. Clearly, in half a century, we have made staggering advancements in sheer computation power. I told you that uh, one of the things that has made a big difference in um, uh, neural networks is that the old neural networks, first of all, they were very simple. They had they had very few layers, so they couldn't uh, do so, some things that you could do in mathematical logic. But also, they had to be trained sequentially. That is the end of any project. The real jump was when uh, the machine learning and the sort of uh, system that we have became trainable in parallel. At that point, all you need is a lot of computation power. Computational power gets infinitely better if you can transform it from software-based, which is what you have here, to hardware-based, which means you have a dedicated physical structure to do that job. It doesn't do the other jobs well, but it does that particular job, which is training a, a, a large language model, way better because it's way faster. That is normally called the graphics card. And the first thing that uh, Elon Musk did after having signed the letter, AI is the end of the world, is going to destroy the world, please stop, please no, have legislation stop, was to buy 10,000, not what, 10,000 NVIDIA graphic cards to build its own AI company, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, with 10,000 graphic, which are quite expensive, uh, you have a lot of competition power. A footnote, not for today, for another day, NVIDIA went up and down. Eh? Now, I wish I had bought it when it went down. It went down as soon as we got the winter of um, all the um, uh, Bitcoin, etc. cetera, uh, uh, the crypto. Uh, to develop the crypto, you need a completion of power. Completion power, um, NVIDIA, which is the best producer of these uh, graphic uh, cards. You couldn't buy them online. I mean, people were scavenging uh, uh, secondhand stuff uh, around to get enough completion power to get enough so, uh, of the cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency goes down, collapse, end of the story. You could throw them out of the window. No one wanted uh, a graphic card like NVIDIA dead. All of a sudden, someone realizes that to do all this training, you need the same kind of cards, boom, and it passes the one billion. Newspaper in Italy said, a rather unknown company has just passed the one billion dollars uh, uh, evaluation on some. Number one, if he has passed the one billion dollars, maybe it's not unknown, maybe you don't know it. <laughs> so, uh, number two, Wikipedia. Oh, what's Wikipedia for? No, no. Anyway, back to us. So, uh, a lot of computation, more data than we have ever seen. I'll show you a picture a little bit in a moment. Better machine learning, as I told you, now we can do in parallel, many, many layers, etc. Algorithms, of course, more Internet of Things. I just gave you the example of my phone connected to the, uh, the, 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 the thermostat, knowing where I am. But well, that's the kind of interactions between gadgets that make the infrastructure around us increasingly sort of friendly towards more of those interactions. And of course, more on life, more of our life being spent inside the digital sort of uh, environment, meaning that therefore our data. For example, this lecture will be available on YouTube, which will mean you know, more data, for example, for uh, extra training for ChatGPT. So I need to be careful to say here what ChatGPT cannot do because you will learn it from YouTube. So, so, yeah. Back to us. Um, this is uh, again from the past, uh, uh, how one of the typical example of growth of uh, data and users. This, I wanted to show you uh, this uh, in terms of um, um, just vocal interaction, because the picture that I gave you before, the one on how good the systems have become in voice recognition, is because we have a lot of voice too to train them on. And of course today, uh, moving increasingly towards a visual and oral culture and less and less writing, this is becoming the future. So we interface, uh, we interact with all this world more visually and more orally than ever before, and increasingly so, probably. Point number three uh, is, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this um, sort of uh, enveloping uh, later, but um, uh, sake of uh, making sure that we cover everything. The point number three is, um, is a bit more subtle and it's a bit more conceptual. Remember that little round thing, so we move why AI is successful. Is a divorce. How can a divorce be successful? Because several things have happened. One, we move from mathematical logic to statistics. We don't care about if then. We don't care about deterministic. And therefore, we don't care about certainty. Certainty goes out of the window. The moment you rely on machines that are based on statistical uh, calculations, on probability, the possibility of proving that that machine is zero fault goes out of the window by definition. This is another thing that we debated here in Italy at the forefront of the debate on should people be allowed or not allowed to use ChatGPT, etc. And one of the points raised by um, the Garante was sometimes these systems say something false. And they're probabilistic. I mean, there's no way you can even remotely in principle, build them so that that doesn't happen. They're not pocket calculators. They're not databases. A database, you can actually build it, check it, lock it, and say anything that is in the database has been checked and locked, and yes, you say all the people in this room are in the database, the names are correct, the surnames are correct, the date of birth are correct, full stop. You can, in principle, do it. But if that is not a database, and it's not an sort of, uh, um, deterministic pocket calculator is a probabilistic 
quote unquote, calculator of strings of language, requiring that system to be certain is not understanding how it works or understanding how it works and deciding that it cannot be used full stop. Now, if I put this as a condition, either I'm not, I'm not clear about what I'm asking or I know exactly what I'm asking and I'm telling you, you cannot do it. It would be like saying, look, unless you can show me how to fly, you cannot pass the exam. What have I done? Either I don't know about your you know, biological conditions, which is you don't fly, or I'm just saying you're never going to pass the exam. That's, an, that's just code for you're never going to pass the exam because you can't fly. So these things, uh, of course, uh, are probabilistic systems. That was point number one. From, from mathematical logic to statistics. Point number two, we are building the environment around them. We don't unleash androids in the world, no matter what. Uh, so uh, and again, Elon Musk pretends to be doing to drive cars. A driverless car is, as the terminology says, a car without a driver, not with a driver that is an android that replaces me, as in Star Wars. How many times have you seen something going with a robot behind? No, we are rebuilding the car. We are constructing a network within which the car works. Point number three, we are increasingly pushing as a humanity technology historically as companies, etc., from difficult to complex. It's going to take three minutes to explain this. I hope it's clear enough. The next lecture will be on complexity. So this is a bit of an um, appetizer for that topic. Complexity is something very serious. It's not something that you can learn about by reading Moran. Shall I say that again? If you read Moran, you will not understand what complexity is. Not the scientific kind. If you are talking about something very difficult, very intricate, with a lot of relations, so confusing, foggy, well, that's not what the complexity means. That just means foggy, lots of interactions, very mysterious, complex. And you fill the mouth with this word complex, and you think you've said something serious. You haven't. Complexity is a serious thing, and we will discuss it in the next uh, lecture. Here is an introduction to one, perhaps the king, or rather the queen, of several concepts that we have in science under the term complexity, and it's computational complexity. If you open any textbook introduction to computation, I wonder whether it's chapter one or chapter two that will introduce you to computational complexity. Computational complexity is Pearson in terms of technicalities, but the idea, which is what we need as philosophers, is quite simple and it's beautiful. Imagine, and it's simple, so don't shut down, really simple. Imagine you have a set of problems. You can organize the pro those problems or questions in a thousand ways. For example, in English, you can decide the problems are uh, the W problems. What, why, who, or the H problem, how, etc. One way of organizing those problems is in terms of what it takes to solve the problem. Here's an analogy with a zoo and animals. Imagine you have a zoo and you have lots of animals there. How can you catalog those animals? What is the taxonomy of those animals? In the past, uh, and it's quite funny, the so-called bestiary, so the books about animals, had the most amazing sort of ways of organizing animals. On, for example, whether they could walk or not, whether they could fly, walk, or, I don't know, sneak around, uh, whether they had, uh, how many eggs, legs had, whether they would lie, no, had eggs or not. Of course, uh, the scientific turn in the biology happened when we decided that the best way of cataloging was can they reproduce or not? So when they meet, can they give more 
of what they are or not. So genetic. Right? And that's one way of organizing animals according to you know, the, the genetics. Um, we don't really organize them in terms of whether they live in the sea or not. If you go to the supermarket, we still do that. Huh? You, know, you will find uh, things in the supermarket organized by our own preconception. So you find bananas as if bananas were fruit. They're not, they're seeds. And you find, I don't know, uh, tuna next to the fish, but it isn't, it's a mammal. But that's us, no, like, I like the tuna because it lives in the sea. So I put it together with a, a, a crustacean and so on. They're completely different animals from different perspective, how they reproduce, but we like that kind of catalog. So back to the animals. One way of cataloging those animals would be in terms of what they eat. They eat seeds, they eat only uh, grass, they eat uh, leaves, they eat only fruits. There are some bats, for example, they only eat fruit. Um, they eat uh, meat, they are carnivorous, and so on. So you have the animal, which is the mechanism, and you want to know what is the right input for that mechanism, kind of food. The same with problems. Problems can be structured into computational complexity, meaning what kind of resources are required by that problem to be solvable. In the analogy, what kind of uh, resources do they eat to survive, not to work? Now, the resources in question for a computational, uh, from a computational perspective are time and space. But in a computational context, of course, time is how many steps does it take? And space is how much memory does it take? So when you see the normally Windows, it doesn't happen often with a Mac, but Windows on a regular basis, it, it freezes. It means that something you were trying to do, computational problem, required more resources, food, that the computer had to satisfy the demand. So there was a, a misalignment between the problem and the computational resources required. It froze, it mean, means it died. But what computational resources were we talking about? Well, amount of memory and computational power so that that task will be completed. Once you have this view of the world as something which is a bit of an extension, because let me complete. In computational context, of course, you need to have a single language through which you can translate every problem into a problem of computation, which requires space and time, steps and memory. That language is a Turing machine. So you have a single vocabulary, a Turing machine like that enable, it doesn't matter whether you know or you don't know what a Turing machine is, it doesn't matter. It's imagine like a single language that enables you to translate all possible computational problems into a, a unique single language, which will then enable you to catalog all the problems into how difficult, how many resources does it take to solve it? At that point, you have a way of proving that some problems are unsolvable, not because they are in principle unsolvable, but because they would require more resources that we will ever have in this universe. For example, it will require more space than every atom in this universe could possibly uh, include. There's not enough space, no matter what you do. So imagine that all the atoms in the world are 10 and the computational power, sorry, uh, no, resource required by this problem is 20. You need more than the number of atoms in terms of computational space to solve the problem. Is it solvable? Well, in principle, but not in practice, you could never do it. The other way around, so to speak, how much um, power, not just memory, but how many steps, therefore, does it take to solve that problem? Well, it might take one, two, five, X number of steps, or it might take so many steps that the life of the universe is no long enough to contain all those steps. How many steps does it take? No, a gazillion and a half. How much time do I have? A gazillion. It's not going to happen. 
Now, mathematical logic, because it works only on the logically impossible, it will tell you that computationally unfeasible problems are still logically possible. You could still prove that theorem because the only limits are practical. You don't have enough time, even if you have all the time in the universe, and you don't have enough space, even if you have the whole universe as a memory bank. The logic says that that problem is still logically possible to solve. But remember, now we know that possible has different meanings. Zero probability is not what we're talking about here. There's another uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, way of looking at this. When, if you are a computer scientist, you don't care about two things when it comes to logic, at least. One is logically doable. I know, but it takes more space than the universe and more time than the universe. No, yeah. Right. Okay, good. Now, so how do we reduce the complexity of that problem to such a level that maybe it doesn't give you exactly what you want, but it gives you good enough in the time and space that you have? Hmm? Or, and the other thing is, indirect ways of proving that that is the case. This is just for the logicians among us, and I'll stop here. But I think it's very interesting, so I can't pass the opportunity. In logic, you can prove things directly or indirectly. Directly, it means that you have a string of symbols, you transform those symbols to, 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 all the way down to the actual string of symbols that you want. I'm oversimplifying, but that's the way. Axioms, transformation, you never leave the actual space of those symbols. Transform, 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 transform until you get to the conclusion. In the indirect proof, you have the statement of the problem, the, the, the strings, and says, Imagine that is not the case. If it's not the case, then all this follows. Transformation, transformation, transformation. You reach a point that is a contradiction. Impossible, not improbable, impossible. You reach something that says A is different from A. But therefore, because it's impossible, the premise was false. But the premise is said, that that was not the case. So that is the case. I'll do that once again. You want to prove P. You assume that not P. You derive a contradiction. Therefore, it is not true that not P, which must be the case that P. Do I have a way of actually transforming P into what I need? No. So for a, a mathematician, that's fine. For uh, a logician, that's fine. But for a computer scientist who needs to have their strings of symbols at the end in terms of transformation, that's useless. Say, so, okay, well, at least I have a proof in principle that this is doable, but I don't have a proof of how to transform P into Q. All I know is that P is okay. Back to us. This was a bit of a stretch. So, computational resources come in terms of, as I said, uh, in computation, in computation terms, uh, space and time, uh, memory and computation power, steps to be taken. Imagine that on the X axis, we put how much does it take? Or metaphorically now, because we are borrowing from that context, we cannot really be that precise, but that gives you a sense of how precise it could be if only. But let's move from the computational context and say, OK, well, problems of all kind can be organized into it doesn't really take any computational resources. It's simple to do this. Or is actually more and more complex from 0 to 1 or any sort of real numbers in between 0 0.1, 0 0.11, etc. Now, let's put on the y axis skills. Now, in psychology, you actually have a scale It's possible to quantify, although it's way less precise, as you may imagine, than in computational theory, how skills go from, in terms of tasks, easy to difficult. It's the same logic. You have a task. How easy is it? What does it take for that task to be performed? Very little, 
it's easy. A lot, it's difficult. So now you have these two axes. The, how much does it take in terms of computational power and how much does it take in terms of skills to perform, turn the light on. That is in terms of how many steps does it take Click that. And what kind of skills? Super easy. A five years old can annoy anyone in a room like tick, 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 forever. No? A five years old can do it. Skills, super easy. Competition, resources, very, very limited. As you can tell, I'm oversimplifying and I'm using a little bit of an analogy here, but I hope we are on the same page. Tie your shoes. Mm, that also takes very few steps. I never counted, and depending on how you count, it could be maybe five, six, one, two, three, four, I don't know, but not more than 10, probably. Make it 20, but I mean, you don't, it's not going to take the life of the universe normally. Uh, no. But I remember when I was taught by my mom, literally, to tie my shoes. There was a time when I did not know how to tie my shoes. You had to ask, oh, it's always mom, by the way. I don't know whether you know, things have changed these days, but. I think there's a tendency. So tie your shoes is, in terms of computational resources, so to speak, simple, but in terms of uh, skills, very difficult. Now, some time ago, um, uh, Nike tried to launch a pair of shoes that could tie themselves. Uh, a failure, uh, some funny jokes uh, uh, when the app doesn't quite work, but they, they had to reinvent the shoes. There wasn't something like a, a sort of a, an Android coming there and you know, tying your shoes for you. They had to restructure the shoes so that there were little uh, sort of, uh, engines that would squeeze and expand. I don't think uh, uh, it was a great success. The CEO of Adidas, uh, how do I know these things now? That's little factoids. But the, I think it was the CEO of Adidas who said that if you buy a pair of shoes and you find them in a box with the laces probably put inside, no, probably tied, someone has done it by hand. The reason why normally these days you buy a pair of shoes and the, no, the laces are on one side and you have to do it is because there is no robot that has the dexterity of doing that for us. Okay, so whether things have changed or not, never put limits. But it's probably too expensive and you wouldn't do it and you wouldn't do a good job and it would be pointless. It's much cheaper, cheaper to sort of outsource this on the customers. Uh, the customer gets the box with the laces. Dishwashing. And now I'm over stretching and any computational person here, forgive me because I'm, this is not really the way it is. But in order to make it simple, let's say at least in terms of how many steps, it could take, no, a very few steps, logically speaking. Take the dish, underwater, soap, rinse, dry, repeat. That's a nice, no, simple argument, as here my wife was saying, even if lost, no, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But imagine that you have tons of dishes, so it could take uh, a little bit more than just turning the light on. No? I said, it's not exactly this way. For the competition of people, even listening to this, I know that you know, please, you should know that I know. I'm always simplifying. Thank you. Iron shirts. Well, that takes much more than uh, dishwashing. The algorithm is more complicated uh, and um, the skills are much advanced. So the whole point is that the history of AI is a success whenever you move from difficult to complex. Now, that sentence takes the previous 10 minutes of explanation, but I hope you understand what I'm talking about here. So if you have a company and you want to know whether you can use AI to improve the performance of that company, you need to ask, do we have difficult tasks that can be translated into complex tasks? Because when it comes to complexity, AI eats complexity of that kind for breakfast. It doesn't care that there are gazillions of steps to be made, billions of data uh, points to be uh, uh, transformed or absorbed, or, it's a piece of cake. But if it is difficult and it stays difficult, well then that is going to be a problem for any AI system. It doesn't matter how much computational power you throw at it, 
you need to find a way of redesigning things so that it becomes difficult to complex. That is a lot of the history of enveloping. You transform the world so that the world is not a difficult world, it's a complex world in the clear and scientific terminology I introduced here. Is competition complex? You can do that. AI is going to be a fantastic sort of solution. You can't do that, or it's too expensive, or too awkward, cumbersome, etc. Socially not acceptable? No way. This, therefore, enveloping computational difficult, this is the ironing that I told you about. Can it be done? Yes, it can. There it is. This is actually a robot. Um, uh, there would be probably some music that I would like to avoid, but um, uh, inevitably, I'll show it to you. Um, this robot is 1.8, requires a whole room. You need to put the shirt on the board. You need to collect it from the board, but it does iron it. This is not a future. A hundred percent. I'm happy to come back here year after year after year. I bet my shirt that this is not a future. Because this thing clearly has in mind the wrong model of AI. It thinks we are going to build something like us, an Android that does the shirts like me. It will be like having an Android that walks into the kitchen and does the dishes as I do the dishes. No, I have a dishwasher. The dishwasher does the dishes in a completely different way. It's insane to do the dishes like a dishwasher. Why does the dishwasher work? It has an envelope, a box, inside which the robot works very well. And so is the washing machine. And so is this thing. Now, this, unfortunately, uh, uh, the company went bankrupt. But there are more. Uh, and I, I like this video, so I kept it. Uh, don't even try it because uh, it didn't work. Now, the, the company. But there are plenty of companies that are trying to do exactly this. <laughs> Two different views of AI and its future. This is the future. You build the box around the abilities of the robot. That box and inside the box is friendly too. Is the envelope that. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. If I had two companies, one, two startups, you have a hundred, say dollars, make it like international currency, now, euros, pounds, now, to invest. Would you invest in this or in the other? Oh, it's no brainer. This is going. If it, if it is successful, it may not for a, a thousand reasons. But if it is, it's going to be in every room, or in every house. It's like a dishwasher. You're going to sell millions of these things, assuming that it works. It may not, but, and that's not the point. The point is that the other one is clearly a no starting point. Number four, making good progress. I um, wonder whether we should, it's 12, five past 12, so we do have time for Q&A. I wonder whether we should stop here and then do number four in the afternoon and maybe have some questions. What do we have online? Anyone asking questions? If nobody's asking, sorry, we'll go. Shall we stop here uh, and uh, maybe cover a few things, you know, also clarifications, questions, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you more about number four uh, in the afternoon. I'll stop sharing it. And, um, Okay, so uh, let's cover some, some Q&A. Um, as I said, in the afternoon today, uh, at 2 o'clock Italian time, we reconvene, am I right? Yes. Uh, and uh, we reconvene here in this room uh, or online uh, for anyone who wants to be with us. So um, I think I can read the questions. Yeah. Uh, oh, Monique, do we have a question in the chat? Yes. Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your lecture today. And I found very interesting when you were talking about the values and um, the training um, artificial intelligence, but I, I could not understand. I, I, I'm sorry if I missed. Um, you said something like, I hate to push the usual human rights agenda. And uh, I, I, I I found interesting because um, mm -hmm. Like, isn't this the discourse that is missing to align uh, human values and ethics with AI? It's exactly to push the human rights agenda. Sorry if I misinterpreted, but I, I, I think I couldn't understand pretty pretty well um, this point. I think if you repeat the question more slowly, I'll uh, probably do a better job in answering it. Is that what <laughs> Sorry. Um, wait, wait, about apologizing to actually asking the question. Just, just a straightforward, simple question. Okay, I couldn't understand uh, why have you said I hate to push the usual human rights agenda when talking about values and uh, ethics. Um, because it's become, become a rather trite, uh, uh, obvious point, um, that whenever anything happens um, uh, concerning uh, the ethics of AI, the first goal is for, for example, uh, gender discrimination or um, uh, ethnic uh, imbalance or digital divide. And I hate to go with the wave. Um, it doesn't mean that the wave is wrong, the wave is there and it's very important, but it's a bit, um, the risk of repeating a message is to make that message true. Uh, if we keep saying that, uh, of course, AI discriminates, my worry is that at some point we will become deaf to that particular point. That's why I raised this issue uh, as saying, look, I hate to be so obvious, but obvious it is. And it's a matter of fact that this, um, say, package models, for example, or other mechanisms like that, are trained by some humans or some other humans, and the values that go into the training are sometimes clear, sometimes are not, um, and sometimes questionable. The, last point that I think I made was that so far we may not find them too questionable sometimes. Uh, not the example of the stake, I guess people can live with that, but we shouldn't be complacent at all because um, first of all, we're not quite sure what's the depth of the um, uh, bias that might be present uh, in this or other mechanism. We know that when we have investigated, and I say we as in man, you know, in this room, when people have investigated, sometimes the bio was profound and was uh, astonishing you know, in terms of people getting or not getting jobs, getting or not getting an interview, getting or not getting a mortgage, or getting a different kind of penalty uh, through a court. And, and this is all America, by the way, which we blame for what it's doing, but at the same time, we should be grateful for showing what's happening because we don't know what's happened in other parts of the world. So yes, it stinks there, but at least you, you, can, you can perceive the smell, whereas I'm worried that in other places it doesn't stink, not because it doesn't stink, but because the smell is not there to be perceived in the first place. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I uh, misled anyone into uh, thinking that I'm not so <laughs> appalled by the whole thing, and I don't think that this is a, a serious issue. I'm just worried by the rhetoric that sometimes pushes this as the only agenda because he risks making it trivial. Um, and you now we get used to it. Oh yeah, yeah, bias, et cetera. Of course, there's a problem. And of course, no, they may not be discriminated. Of course, people with different kind of ethnicity or different you know, religious or sexual orientation are being discriminated. Oh, okay, fine, who cares? Well, no, it, it, we do care and, and it's crucial and it's fundamental. So it was more a, a way of signaling the importance of the point uh, rather than uh, letting it go as a, oh, by the way, usual problems, see above. I hope that explains. Yes, thank you so much, Professor. Yep. Are there any questions, uh, even in, also in the room? Oh, uh, we have a, a question in the room. I think you have to come here so that everybody can hear. Yeah, thank you. We have a question coming. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I have just a quick question because we talked about uh, cultural sensitivities. You say that, uh, and I was wondering. You talk about if, cultural... you do, if you do it slowly, because not everybody yeah. is English speaker. So. You're right. Sorry. Yeah. 
uh, we were talking about uh, cultural sensitivity, you know, cultural open, sensitivity, force meat, uh, cow meat, and so and so. Uh, and this let me wonder about uh, other potential issues uh, in uh, different countries because uh, we know that uh, different countries have different also political sensitivities, which may be a lot important and <laughs> even existential. Uh, I mean, we, I'm recorded, so I'm just a neutral, but for instance, I can think talking about us, that uh, in the pool of uh, ChatGPT, there is also Sputnik News and Russia Today, which today are quite sensitive and banned here. So I was wondering, uh, what is what may be the impact on the unity of this model? Uh, is it feasible to create like uh, one AI for all the world, or will we have a regulation that will create a fragmentation in that process? Thank you. That, now, that is a, a really super important question. Um, I think it's difficult to predict what's going to happen um, always, especially in this particular case. But we, we can imagine a couple of scenarios here, quite obvious. One is that um, AI as a service, which is you not know, the kind of chat GPT that you get, um, will be probably um, limited or blocked. Now, in fact, if you if you go online, um, there is a list of countries that do not allow people to use ChatGPT in particular, and they are the usual suspects, so in China included, for example, just to be plain. Um, the question then becomes, will they block this technology full stop, or they will, will they block it and provide their own? I think that that is more likely. So not only you will not have access to ChatGPT in China, but you will also have uh, access to the Chinese version with all the sensitivities and the political nuances and the cultural uh, specificities that one may expect, which reinforces a problem that we have had since social media, meaning if I'm in that particular bubble or in that context or in that country, or in that sort of a network, the access to that sort of information, uh, how much is it filtered? How much do I not see? What is it that I'm not actually able to uh, access? In context like sort of us here, or Western countries, or wherever there is a, big comp a little bit of competition, and sometimes there's not much competition, but there is a little bit, there is an extra chance of getting a different variety of information, basically. I'm not being sort of deluded. I know that we are also under no, uh, strict sort of, uh, expectations that there are uh, uh, frameworks around us. Um, but because there's some level of competition between different sources, there is a chance, not many, not big, but a chance of uh, getting, uh, well, shall we say, better information than in, in a context where that chance is sort of eliminated at the source. But what we have seen in social media is going to affect precisely also all the AI as a service, including this one. So anyone who has considered, which is a mistake, but has been using ChatGPT as if it were a search engine, a mistake, of course. Uh, at least should have this mind, this much in mind, which is in the same way as my search engine comes with a perspective bias, etc. So does my AI sort of as a service, pretty much in the same way. So wrong or mistaken way of using the tool, but at least the same awareness in terms of it comes from that particular source. It comes with that kind of bias and baggage and sort of framework, et cetera. Uh, for those of uh, us who haven't been exposed to this much, um, uh, the chat GPT and a large language model is not a search engine. Sometimes these days it's becoming increasingly difficult to discriminate between the two because of course they are being uh, wrapped around or bundled together into a single sort of service. So at some point today, tomorrow, and it's already available, uh, you can already use it. But once you do the search engine uh, thing, which is including ChatGPT, or ChatGPT also is linked to uh, Binge, or it's a, in other words, if it becomes a unique service, well then um, 
the, the distinction goes out of the window. But normally, at this stage, if you use, say, a, a classic search engine as Google and ChatGPT on their side, and you keep them in separate as two different services, what well, ChatGPT is, uh, a, is not updated or is updated up to the date that they provide you. No, you need to read the small print that says last training done in day X, Y, and Z, you know, month and year. Any information after that is not in the in the database on which ChatGPT has been trained. So don't ask the results of the you know, last game yesterday uh, to ChatGPT because it doesn't have the information that is for Google. Um, at the same time, if you need some deeper information synthesized in one go, for example, who are the top you not know, 10 uh, writers in my set. It might as well, you may as well use ask ChatGPT, which probably gives you a, a, a faster and, and a more easily digestible sort of uh, information. But back to your question, um, any cultural sensitivity, political bias, all that, which means I get this perspective rather than another, here, as in social media, as in search engines, anything digital comes with a perspective. We need to know that and we need to be able to use them properly. That is not easy. Um, anyone else here or in online? I know it's getting late. Um, so unless there's anyone else, and I'm not seeing any hand raised in the chat, um, I think we can, oh, uh, there's, there's a question. Uh, final question uh, here at the mic. Hello. Um, since we talked about the old style of AI, uh, also data driven AI in contrast to logic based AI, I was wondering, I wanted to ask you if you think it could be useful or speakable to have systems that combine these two different uh, approaches. Yeah, that's, an, that's another great question. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll tell you what uh, I've seen happening um, and whether it's um, a partial view uh, up to you to, uh, to decide. So one major problem with uh, the, the mechanism that we have today, uh, the, the machine learning, the large language models, the neural networks, etc., is that to be clarified when we do the lecture on complexity, they're very complex. In other words, they have a structure that contains so many points, nodes, and so many links, and so many balances, thresholds, that you cannot tell why they did what they did. Now, there's nothing magic about it. The analogy here is with traffic downtown. Imagine you are in Bologna and it's no, there's a lot of traffic, and someone wants to know. In other words, wants an explanation for traffic downtown in Bologna. And you have to give them two different kinds of explanations. One is the old Newtonian billiard ball hitting each other kind of explanation, which means I want to know why every car is there at that moment. Answer, a pause. Like, that, 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 that hasn't cars. God knows why everybody, Mary, Laura, Peter, and John are there. The other explanation is, can you explain why there's so much traffic in Bologna today? Oh, look, it's Monday morning, it's raining, it's 8.30, schools are opening, and everybody's going to the office. Ah, okay. But why last Monday? Oh, sorry, there's also um, um, a um, strike, no buses, and there's been an accident on the motorway. Okay, fine. That's a perfect reasonable explanation. That's where we draw the line. That explains why there is traffic this morning in Bologna. It's completely different from the other one, the every single individual. So getting to the point. The old uh, AI, the one logic base, had lines of codes, and you could check every single line. At some point, you would find where things went wrong. So you had the a billion ball, every car in traffic kind of explanation. You could tell exactly where things could go well or better, could be improved. The other system is only able to provide an explanation that is at that very much uh, 
and I say that the less granularity of the level of abstraction, Monday morning schooling, etc. So what is coming out is combining the two. So imagine a system where the old AI logic system controls the neural network. The neural network gives you all the power to do, for example, what ChatGPT does. The symbolic, so-called, uh, not the neural network, but symbolic system, logic base, etc., gives you the power to control the system. So you know how system A, which controls system B, is working line by line. So you could have a control of A that controls B when B is not explainable in the same way as A is. So A, which is the old symbolic logic, is explainable but not able to perform as B. B performs not infinitely better, but it's not explainable as A is. You put together two and you have, shall we say, human, symbolic, and uh, neural network in a sort of line of command, so to speak, where things can work way more efficiently. Whether this is the only case or even a promising case of interaction between the old symbolic logic base and the new non-neural network, et cetera, et cetera, uh, AI, I can't tell you. I certainly, that's where I would put my money. Okay. If that works, that's where things are going to be very fruitful. Uh, otherwise, uh, if, if it's just a competition, uh, most of the times, uh, the kind of things that we see today uh, really advancing are the machine learning and the symbolic is becoming less and less sort of um, uh, common. I'm not technically proficient enough to be able to tell you where the symbolic is preferable to the, say, uh, neural network, but I can tell uh, in terms of pure logic, not in terms of technology or computational uh, power, that there are plenty of problems where probably you know, a sort of symbolic solution is more efficient than one uh, that is a uh, neural network. Final comment in terms of competition, there are areas where you need to be able to prove that the system performs as it says it performs. In other words, that the system delivers every and only result is, is complete and coherent um, that you want. Because the system, for example, is running a nuclear power station. You cannot afford their main beam. Oh, there's only a chance out of a thousand that things will go wrong. You can't do that. So mission critical, um, uh, mission critical software normally, normally goes under the formal methods kind of analysis. With formal methods, you can model the software in such a way that you can prove it as if you were a piece of mathematics. Now, formal methods are used normally in really mission critical uh, sort of it's a software like, for example, uh, airplane so, uh, software or nuclear power software. Those are the two, two classic examples. So any uh, context where probability that something might go wrong, not that it breaks, that's something story, but that intrinsically the system works in terms of most likely this is the right thing to do, that is not quite acceptable. So those contexts you know, will remain symbolic, etc., mathematical, blah, blah, blah. The other ones, you know, the everyday uh, sort of life, for example, including uh, sort of scanning and X-ray, well, that is way more uh, likely to be entirely dominated by uh, neural networks. Even if that X-ray could be about my cancer, so I like to have the certainty of the symbolic kind. But that is, you no, know, we are set uh, a, a certain degree of uh, uncertainty, a, ma a, a margin of error that is uh, part of the uh, of the business. Well, there is no margin margin of error acceptable in the design. Then we switch to the other. So potential collaboration, but also uh, competition, and then for areas where symbolic will, will be privileged and dominating, others more and more where things instead will go towards the kind of uh, machine learning that we have seen today. If my dishwasher tomorrow will have a decent machine learning system, so I don't make a mess of all the glasses, that would be nice. Because I've been throwing glasses away, in fact, by now I do them by hand, because there is no way the dishwasher does a decent job with that. Now, they will become those, no, whitish, all ruined, especially the ones you care about. But you can tell it's almost lunch because when you start thinking about dishwashers, maybe, no, okay. So I'll see you after uh, after lunch uh, at two o'clock, uh, uh, Italian time. See you, bye.